let's see, this is the, we've got two more sessions after this one. Next week is uh, JJ Jones, and he's going to talk about uh, tax, uh, tax uh, implications in a cow-calf operation, and, and particularly uh, for those folks who are having to destock and market some animals, so on and so forth. So that ought to be a real helpful session. He's uh, he's an outstanding resource for that topic, and that's that's what he does twenty four seven in his career. And he's just an excellent expert on uh, tax consideration. So we're looking forward to that. Um, I'll let, uh, I'm David Lawman, Extension Beef Cattle Specialist. Uh, let my two partners in crime uh, introduce themselves. I'm Rosalind Biggs. I'm also a beef cattle extension specialist uh, and I am a veterinarian housed in the College of Veterinary Medicine. I'm Paul Beck. I'm a, a beef extension specialist uh, stationed here at Stillwater in the Animal Science Department. So the, today's topic, um, you know what? All feed prices have increased substantially the last two years. Uh, last year we had a pretty good jump and this year we had another big jump in feed prices. We've had a lot of people asking about, uh, you know, incorporation of other protein sources because our standard oil seed meals, cotton seed meal, soybean meal are, are very expensive this year. And so uh, while even though uh, cost of urea, feed grade urea as a non-protein nitrogen, it's gone up too, but it's still from a protein equivalent standpoint hasn't gone up near to the extent that the oil seed meals have. Therefore, people are just wondering if there are, you know, what situations might they be able to incorporate those lower priced, really nitrogen sources. We think of them as crude protein sources. And so Dr. Beck has worked on a lot, this topic a lot throughout his career and a lot of supplementation work. And he's an, he's an excellent uh, scientist to address this topic. So Paul. Thank you, Dave. So the first thing I want to say is uh, when we're talking about wintering beef cows on primarily lower quality forages, um, those inexpensive uh, non-protein nitrogen sources are um, very ineffective. Uh, especially whenever we're including those into a, a dry type supplement. Um, the use of those in feedlot rations where there's a lot of energy available for the uh, microbial incorporation of that nitrogen into the uh, uh, proteins that they're creating um, works really well. But in a high forage diet, especially our lower quality diets that we're going to be uh, looking at this, this winter primarily, um, the, the efficiency of that transfer of nitrogen into uh, <clears throat> uh, protein is, is uh, not as efficient and it, it, it's very, very lowly efficient. So with that, we're going to start talking about protein sources and we're going to look at this primarily from uh, the wintering beef cows uh, on lower quality forages. Um, and so what are the options to reduce these costs? And, and to start with, you know, uh, Daryl Peel always says it, and I, you know, a lot of times we, we lose sight of the fact that feed markets, uh, along with, you know, everything else that we produce and, and um, you know, try to buy and sell are, are a global market. Um, and in this, this case, uh, you know, we're looking at a, you know, extreme example of those outside influences and how they can affect our uh, input prices as far as feed and fertilizer. And that's, you know, 
we we can blame the current market price on all the things that we blamed everything else on for the last couple of years. You know, the COVID-19, it slowed the economy, decreased oil use and decreased prices, but it also caused supply chain issues, labor shortages, trucking, and we all know all of this. Then we had an increased economic activity, increased oil use, um, increased oil and fuel prices and commodity prices. So, you know, all those things really impact this. And then we have a war in Eastern Europe that we all know about. And I'm, I'm sure we're all aware that, you know, Russia and Ukraine both are uh, very highly uh, uh, agricultural, um, very big exporters of not only grains, but also oil seeds, uh, sunflower, sun, uh, soybeans and, and the like. Um, with our decreased oil production, what, what, whatever that reason may be, um, we have high oil and natural gas prices leading to less fertilizer and, and Ukraine and, and uh, Russia are both fertilizer exporters as well, leading to a high global fertilizer prices as well as high value for soybeans for oil because of the incorporation of of uh, vegetable oils into uh, not only just biodiesel, but the next generation of uh, natural diesel. So my original theory when we were talking about, you know, feed markets, you know, coming up for this winter, when we we're looking at uh, planting, um, corn is a very high input crop with very high fertilizer use. So I assume there'd be a bigger shift uh, in acres to soybeans, um, giving us lots of soybean meal, uh, which would influence the cost of all of our protein feeds. Um, the high fuel cost uh, increases the value of ethanol. Uh, I have some friends in the ethanol industry that, that tell me, you know, if corn's at 10 or $11 a bushel, they can still afford to buy corn and create ethanol. So, you know, the higher the value of uh, gasoline or the higher the cost of gasoline, the higher the value of the ethanol, that gives us a lot more distiller's grains. So my thought because of that is if we can produce abundant low quality hay, straw and corn stalks, uh, crop residues, we should be able to get cattle through the winter just on roughage and cake. Uh, as my dad always used to call, you know, uh, high protein, uh, meal cubes, but we all know what what happened with our drought. Um, we're there's not a lot of straw produced uh, from our wheat crop. Um, our our even our prairie hay, our lower quality grass hays, are producing about half of what they normally would. Um, we don't know what the corn stalks are going to look like, or 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 Milo stubble uh, or stover. Um, and that may be a, a potential source of roughage to get us through the winter. But we may not have that abundant uh, amount of low quality straw uh, or, or hay. Um, the, uh, when we are looking at about planting time for corn, uh, this is one of the first things that shot my uh, theory down is there in March and April and May, corn started going up really rapidly. You know, it looks like we have about the same $2 move here in corn and soybeans, and we do. Um, but when we're going from about the uh, 550 up to, or 580 up to about 780, you know, that's a 25% increase uh, in, in corn prices right there about planting time. Um, we had the same $2 increase in soybean prices or as far as the soybean futures, um, but that's only about a 10% change because, you know, it's just moving from about $14.20 up to about $16. So the relative value of corn for the producers of corn was enough greater. They felt that, uh, I'm assuming they felt like they could offset the increased costs of the inputs. So um, we had a lot more acres uh, 
go into corn. And, and a recent cattle facts update, you know, said on the soybean side, there's a great potential for revisions higher for export um, because it's a global market and they're not able to get soybeans from the Ukraine. Um, they've already sold the ex yearly export estimate as of April. So they're going to, we can assume, sell a lot more beans on the global market. Um, because of decreased acres of beans and, and also decreased harvested acres of beans because of some drought in other areas, oilseed production is projected to be down because of a decreased soybean crush uh, based on reduced meal exports. So because we don't have as many uh, exports going out. Um, there, there may, um, you know, there's going to be less soybean meal available. Corn production is forecast to be 45 mi million bushels higher. Thus, we have the decreased back down uh, in, in corn prices uh, down to the mid fives, which may or may not last very long into the winter. But we have greater harvested and, pl and planted and, and expected harvested acres with an expected level uh, uh, yield. Um, ethanol production is up 10%, but distillers grains exports are also up. So um, my theory about, you know, cheap protein in relation to the, the uh, energy feeds associated with the cost of corn um, probably is not going to come to fruition. So as everybody was expecting earlier, uh, protein is going to be expensive uh, and it's going to be harder to produce that on as far as higher quality hay just because of the higher fertilizer prices. And keep in mind, our byproduct feeds, if we're using those for energy uh, and other grains and energy sources are based off from the price of corn uh, for the most part, uh, our protein sources are going to be based off from the price of soybean meal as well. So if we can find a... Uh, a bargain look, using those relationships, then, then that's probably going to be what's our cheapest uh, activity. So the first thing we do when we're trying to estimate what you know the value of feedstuff is, the relative uh, cost of, of a feedstuff is is look at the um, on a you know cost per unit of, of uh, nutrients. Um, I have here some of the common ones that we would think of as far as supplemental options and byproducts, looking at soybean meal first, uh, projected cost of about 5.59 a ton based on uh, current cash prices and, and uh, uh, basis getting it into central Oklahoma. That's about 28 cents per pound. Um, when we look at right at 48% crude protein, that gets us up to about 64 cents per pound of crude protein. Um, corn gluten feed is another uh, popular uh, byproduct, 25% um, crude protein. Um, right now, based on some published markets from four full truckload lots, um, you know, from the factories in, uh, Missouri or Illinois or, for, or from the uh, middlemen to, to buy those from the, the factories, plus freight to get it here to central Oklahoma, where it's about 230 per ton, um, which is cl real close to 12 cents per pound of, uh, of feed and 51 cents per pound of crude protein. So that that's actually a uh, fairly good bargain compared to soybean meal. Dried distiller's grains is another. Um, right now it's $290 a ton uh, with a uh, cost of protein at about 47 cents per pound of protein. Hominy feed is a lower protein type supplement um, from the corn milling industry. Um, Right at 265 per ton, it's about 10% crude protein. So it's uh, right at nearly a buck and a half per pound of 
crude protein. That is a good energy source though. Uh, soybean hulls at $270 a ton. Um, well, you know, these are, are some of those byproducts they used to give away, you know, back in the 90s and, and everybody's using them now. It's right at a dollar uh, per pound of crude protein. When we start looking at the molasses, self-fed molasses type products, um, uh, a high intake um, type cooked tub is uh, right at $960 a ton. Uh, at retail, which is 48 cents per pound, and about $2.44 per pound of crude protein. Uh, we're going to look at some examples on, on how some of these different products may, may work into a, a supplementation program. Uh, lower intake tub, um, those because they're lower intake, they, they're a little bit more concentrated. They're about $1,200 per ton whenever you uh, look at the total cost. Uh, you know, eight, you know, the, these tubs weigh about 250 pounds. Uh, it takes eight of them to make a ton. So if they're right at $150 uh, per tub, then that's how you get uh, to that area. Right at 62 cents per pound of crude protein. Uh, 20, this case, it's a 20% all natural. It'd be about nearly $3 per pound of crude protein. Um, one option that a lot of us uh, used last year, um, and it may pencil out again this year whenever we start comparing to other feedstuffs is alfalfa hay. Um, the USDA market report uh, showed uh, Dairy quality alfalfa hay uh, at $275 a ton, 25% uh, crude protein that calculates up to be about 62 cents per pound of crude protein, which is actually kind of in line with what we see with soybean meal. Um, if we're looking at uh, comparing these byproduct feeds for not just the protein that we're getting, but also the energy, um, you, you need to kind of compare that to soybean meal and corn. Um, right now, the, the corn price for local delivered uh, corn to the co-ops is 586. So if you, you know, know a farmer that's growing corn, you might be able to buy some for that. Um, Semi-load lot of uh, soybean meal is about $550 a, a ton, uh, $560 a ton. Uh, found some prices for uh, uh, rolled corn. Uh, it's right at $328 uh, a ton. Uh, corn gluten feed I put in here at $230 a ton. Dried distiller's grains at $290. Um, a higher quality grass hay. Uh, like a, a fertilized Bermuda grass at $150 a ton. That's right at uh, $70 per, per big round bale. Hominy at $265, soybean holes at $270, and the red, other costs, is, as I ex explained earlier. So I put this into this spreadsheet. A friend of mine at the University of Arkansas put together. Um, Shane Gadbury uh, um, created this to, to look at comparing it for from a protein and energy basis and an energy only basis. And this ratio over here, um, when we're looking at the protein and energy basis, uh, if it's over 100, it's a good deal in relation to those costs of corn and soybean meal. If uh, it's under 100, then it's uh, not as good a deal uh, compared to uh, those base ingredients. So in this case, when we look at uh, corn gluten feed, um, dist dried distiller's grains, um, higher uh, quality Bermuda grass hay uh, or alfalfa hay, those are all over 100, uh, indicating that they're a, a for their protein and in energy they're actually a, a fairly good source 
or a very fairly economical source of those ingredients. When we look at an energy only basis, uh, it's real hard to compete with corn. Um, you know, none of these are, are over 100. So indicating that corn is, if we're just looking at supplying energy uh, at 586 per bushel, it's still going to be uh, about the best deal um, available. Uh, when we look at hominy feed, it's usually considered to be, uh, you know, feeding equivalent to corn or ground corn slightly higher in fat, it's even uh, just at an 80% of the value of, of corn as far as the, the cost on an energy basis. So, you know, it's one excellent way of, of trying to compare the, the value of a feed source um, if we're not just needing uh, uh, protein. So when we start talking about protein requirements, you know, it's, it's really variable. A lot of it depends on the genetics, the, the maintenance requirements of the, the animal, milk potential, uh, growth potential, the uh, composition of the gain, frame size, compensatory gain, or, or gender as far as growing cattle, um, whether that we're trying to put uh, additional uh, gain on cows or if they're a gestating cow, you know, growing the, the fetus uh, or a lactating cow, they're producing milk. So those all have big influences on uh, protein requirements. When we look at the gain, here's of a 600 pound calf, you know, if it's on a low quality diet and not gaining very much, like one pound per day, their protein requirement is right at 9.3%. So fairly low. If we go up to, you know, one and a half or two pounds a day, that uh, increases uh, as we increase the, uh, the average daily gain because they're accreting more muscle on that. Uh, as I pointed out, stage of production, whether it's gestating or, or lactating cows, uh, you know, when we're talking about wintering, cows, that's going to be extremely important. And dry matter intake is, is uh, something that it, it affects the protein requirements because if they're uh, only consuming or only able to consume small amount for a small amount of uh, gain, then our protein requirements are going to be fairly low. But it also affects the intake when we look at uh, dietary protein. So if we get below 7% as a rule of thumb, uh, crude protein as, as a hay, uh, we're going to uh, decrease the intake potential because there's not enough protein available for the microbes in the rumen to uh, digest the uh, fiber. So here's an example of some haze that I've analyzed in the past and doing different meetings on on uh, uh, on farms. It's a uh, 670 samples that we uh, analyzed over about a, a eight year eight year period. You know, on the average, the crude protein was right at 11 and TDN was right at 55. Uh, when we look at the intake potential for that average hay, a cow could consume about 1.7% of her body weight of that hay based on the relative amount of acid detergent fiber and neutral detergent fiber, how fast it's digested and, and how fast it will go through uh, the passage rate through the digestive tract. That's just the average and, and we know there's a range on, on, especially with forages, there's a lot bigger range in quality forages than there would be with cereal grains. Um, so I split it into four quadrants here. 32% uh, of those, those were uh, uh, averaged about 9% crude protein and 49% TDN. Uh, these would be pre predominantly uh, unfertilized warm season. Uh, uh, introduced warm season grasses. Um, 
whenever we look at the fiber contents, you know, and the digestibility of that hay, they can only consume about 1.6% of their body weight per day. We know, you know, the, the protein and energy requirement for a cow um, is a certain number of calories and a certain amount of crude protein or pounds of TDN and pounds of uh, protein. So if it's lower quality, they have to eat more to meet their requirements and they just can't because it's low quality. So it's a catch 22. As the hays get into higher quality, they can consume much more of it. And, you know, when we get into this highest quality hay, then they consume can, can consume right at 2% of their body weight uh, per day, even though they may not need that level of nutrition. A lactating cow would eat about 10% more, so about two and a quarter percent of this better quality hay. You know, and that cow, that would meet that cow's nutrient requirements without uh, supplementation. Uh, as far as a dry pregnant cow, you know, if it's, you know, over 8% uh, crude protein and, you know, right at 50, to 50 to 52% TDN, you know, that's adequate for a dry gestating cows uh, uh, to meet her requirements without supplementation. So it's a really good idea, especially in this year to test our forages and know where we stand in relation to our cows nutrient requirements. So from these 670 uh, hay, test results that we did in, in Southwest Arkansas, um, knowing that there was very little prairie hay in these samples. Um, there was a big range in crude protein from about 3% to 26%, but within each one of those uh, digestibility quadrants, you know, there's very little, there's quite a lot of overlap in crude protein just because of those uh, forage sources are, in that area are uh, fairly high in, in naturally high in, in crude protein. Uh, introduced warm season grasses like Bermuda grass uh, tend to naturally be higher in crude protein than a lot of our Sudan grasses or uh, uh, native prairie uh, type haze. So from, from this data set, 19% of those hays were deficient in crude protein for a dry cow, and 31% were deficient in, in energy for those dry cows. Uh, for a lactating cow, those increased dramatically because those nutrient requirements are so much higher. 45% uh, were deficient in crude protein, and 83% were deficient in total digestible nutrients. So, you know, one, one way we can decrease the amount of supplement that we have to feed is by matching our uh, cow production, our calving dates, um, to our forages instead of trying to match our forages to our, to our cows. So we have lower nutrient requirements when we're uh, feeding hay and supplementing cows through the winter. Uh, and calving, you know, in the spring with a true calf, spring calving season. Um, you know, if, if that meets with uh, your produ production goals, that is a, an excellent way to decrease the, the uh, need for supplementation. Um, but, you know, this year, when we uh, look at the hay that's being produced, um, we may not have enough. Uh, most lots of producers I've talked to when they're uh, getting done baling their hay meadows are looking at about half of their normal production from from a given meadow. So this winter range option may not be uh, available to us uh, at this time. But you know, if we graze that out between you know now and, and we don't get it regrown before we uh, need it this winter, 
we're probably going to have to feed hay for uh, quite a lot longer. Um, so uh, looking at some of the different forage resource options as far as crude protein and TDN uh, for this winter range, if we have it available uh, through from November all the way through January, it's about 5% crude protein and mid 40s in TDN. Uh, prairie hay is, if it's you know fairly mature prairie hay, the average on a lot of those samples that we have looked at in the past is about 7% crude protein and oh, upper 40s to lower 50s in TDN. Uh, Well-managed Bermuda grass uh, with fertilizer in a, a shorter cutting interval, you know, can at least produce a 10% crude protein and 56% TDN. Um, and then some of our crop residue options. Um, wheat straw may be short, but we may be available. Uh, it's generally very low in protein and very low in TDN, four and a half uh, percent crude protein and 45 percent TDN. Corn stalks, um, when we were looking at the drought several years ago, uh, there was a lot of corn stalks being fed. Um, the average on the samples that we were doing, and this is whole plant corn stalks, um, where they were cut and baled um, and fed to beef cows, right at 6.4% crude protein and 45% TDN. Um, that and Milo Stover um, are, you know, there's probably gonna be a lot of waste as far as the very bottom of the stock uh, is concerned. So the quality of, that the cow is selecting may be slightly higher than that. If it's, you know, the upper part of the stem, the leaf, uh, any cobs that get picked up and, and some of that. So Milo Stover um, was surprisingly higher in uh, nutrient quality because most of the time that Milo, when the, the grain is dry, the, the rest of the plant may be uh, actually uh, still green. Um, if there's a rain somewhere after harvest, it could uh, go ahead and, and send up sucker heads. So on the average, those were right at 8% crude protein and 53% and TDN. Uh, and then cotton gin trash. Uh, if you have the a cotton gin available to you, this is a you know very common um, uh, residue that that you know does cows can winter on. Uh, it's fairly high in crude protein, uh, if especially the it's randomly due to how much seed is is in that and and lint and, and a lot of other things, but uh, still fairly low in TDN. It just takes a long time to, di to digest that cotton lint. Um, I have over here on the last column, the TDN to crude protein ratio. And when we look at these, it's um, generally, most of these are, are fairly unbalanced. If we're over seven, for these, um, we're unbalanced and it's the quantity of microbial protein is limited by the amount of protein available to the microbes and the efficiency of the energy use. So there has to be a certain amount of protein available at the same time the fiber is being digested for the microbes to turn that into microbial protein. And that's where the main protein source of, of the cow from the rumen. So um, right now we're looking at, at uh, seven or eight to one, looking at uh, being uh, unbalanced. Um, if we get much, you know, from four down to up to eight, it's actually balanced. And the key to that is, um, when ruminal nitrogen or ruminal protein is limiting, microbial digestion of the fiber is slowed and total fiber digestion is reduced. The passage of the fiber from the rumen slows because, you know, that uh, forage or roughage is, is stuck there in the rumen longer because of decreased passage rate and 
decreased digestion rate, that impacts total hay intake. And so when we get into those very low or very high TDN to crude protein ratios, that's where feeding a protein supplement results in increased hay intake and increased hay digestibility. And that's where we talk about the, the positive associative effects. Uh, the Oklahoma Gold program uh, was developed you know, 20 years ago based on this concept where we can feed a small amount of a protein meal uh, to supply that protein to the rumen microbes to increase the hay or roughage intake. Um, so when, when we're looking at you know, seven or eight as being the, the target, um, the winter range, prairie hay, wheat straw, corn stalks, and milo stover all potentially have some uh, improvement if we add protein uh, to the diet. Um, if we're looking at Bermuda grass hay or the cotton gin trash, those we wouldn't expect to see positive associative effects or increased hay intake and uh, digestibility with that. Here's an example from some research where we had varying levels of uh, distiller's grains uh, fed to some growing heifers. Um, and the original research was only done where they were feeding 0.3 to 1.65% of body weight of the distillers. Um, I modeled and, and, and uh, made some uh, scientific uh, guesses to, to come up with what we would expect intake to be uh, if we did not feed uh, this distiller's grain supplement. And you know this kind of shows where we feed a small amount of a protein feed, 31% crude protein in the uh, distiller's grains that they were feeding. Uh, here they fed one and a half pounds of supplement, and they were able to, you know, this shows we increased uh, hay intake by adding that supplement. So we went from eight pounds of total intake to 11 pounds of total intake. Um, when they went from 0.3 to 0.75% of body weight in that supplementation, you know, that went from one and a half up to 3.6, they didn't see a decrease in uh, hay intake with that added supplement. Um, so the, the heifers were able to consume more, um, even more, uh, total intake, even though they didn't uh, increase uh, hay intake, we already saw the positive associative effect, but we didn't decrease. So we didn't have a, a negative associative effect with that level of feeding. So total intake increased to about 12.8. When we went over that 0.75% up to 1.2% of body weight, which is feeding close to six pounds of uh, that distiller's grain supplement a day, we didn't decrease total intake, but we did decrease hay intake. That's a negative associative effect. Um, and we had about a 60% replacement. So for every additional pound of supplement that was fed, we saw a six tenths of a pound decrease in hay intake. Um, then they went up to 1.65% of body weight uh, saw a slight reduction in, in hay intake. So that's just a good example of where we can see positive associative effects at feeding a certain level of feed and then a negative associative effect once we're uh, beyond the uh, just that impact of, of increasing the digestibility of the, of the forage itself. Um, but in all these cases, as we added more supplement, we're adding more uh, total intake to those animals. So I wanted to look at some cow-calf examples uh, on these protein uh, feeds. And we're looking at a late gestation dry cow with an initial weight of about 1,250 pounds, initial body condition of 
of uh, five, uh, no ion affair force fed, and this is based on an Angus uh, type cow herd. Um, so I put in the different uh, forages that we have available uh, or that I'm using as an example, along with the top three um, feed choices from our, our evaluation as far as the cost of protein and the cost of protein and energy both. Um, looking at soybean meal, corn gluten feed, and distiller strains. Uh, and I used the uh, qualities that we had um, showed before. So using native range as an example in, the, in this, um, that cow will eat about 24 and a half pounds of uh, total feed or total forage, uh, getting about half of the protein that that cow needs. Um, when we look over here, um, 0.92 pounds of crude protein per day versus 1.86 is the requirement. Um, the uh, projected average daily gain without supplementation uh, is about six tenths of a pound loss because we want that cow to gain about 1.1 pounds because of fetal uh, tissue and, and reproductive tissue growth. So, um, you know, that calf and, and associated placenta and everything should gain about 1.1 pounds a day. When we add two pounds of a soybean meal, that will increase our roughage intake because of the positive associative effects I was explaining. So total intake would be about 28 and a half pounds, which is an increase um, of about 10% that meets the cow's um, protein requirement, but we haven't met the energy requirement. Uh, so for a total cost of a buck 16 per day, um, we're gonna lose a body condition score about uh, every 80 days. Um, using distiller's grains in this um, decreases our cost, even though we're feeding three pounds instead of two, we're still seeing the positive associative effects. Because we're feeding three pounds instead of two, we're actually gaining some weight. Um, and it'll take a one, we'll lose a body condition score uh, every 100 days, which is for the 60 day feeding period would be about six tenths of a body condition score, which is not what you would want at this stage, um, going from a five down to a four and a half, but it's still better than, than losing more rapidly. So I put our different examples as far as prairie hay, Bermuda grass hay, uh, wheat straw, corn stalks, milo stover, and gin trash uh, in this, looking at the uh, dry matter intake without a supplement, whether we would expect to see uh, positive associative effects. And, and here, you know, I'm saying with prairie hay, straw, and stalks, we should see if we meet our protein, uh, ruminal protein needs, we should see that 10% or so increase in uh, roughage intake or hay intake. Um, with Bermuda grass, the Milo Stover, and the uh, Gen Trash, we probably would not see any increase in intake if we meet that ruminal uh, requirement. So, looking at soybean meal uh, with prairie hay, it's about 7% crude protein. It'd take one pound of soybean meal or a cost of $1.60 per, per day to lose about a half a body condition score. Uh, through a 60 day uh, feeding period for that stage of production before calving. It would take two pounds of, of corn gluten feed um, to meet that cow's requirements, decreases our cost by about a nickel a day, uh, decreases our body condition loss to about three tenths of the body condition score during that feeding period. Uh, distiller's grains, we'd have to feed about one and a half pounds, uh, decreases our cost even uh, a little bit more, um, showing that, you know, because it's a cheaper source of protein, 
uh, feeding more of this in relation to the soybean meal is actually more beneficial. So that adds the energy to those diets. Uh, the Bermuda grass hay, um, you know, at the cost that we're including, it would not take any uh, supplement to meet that cow's requirements, but it's still going to be more expensive at about $2 per day just to feed that hay. Uh, and on this stage of production, we gain about a tenth of a body condition score in that 60-day uh, period. Um, With the wheat straw, figured at about $40 per ton. Um, if you could find it for that, uh, that's the price I use for all of these crop residue type uh, products. Um, it takes about two pounds of uh, soybean meal at a cost of about a dollar per day, uh, five pounds of a gluten feed at a cost of right at a dollar per day, um, or three and a half pounds of distiller's grains at a cost of about a dollar a day with you know, four tenths to six tenths of a uh, body condition score lost. Um, you know, the Milo, the corn stalks and Milo Stover would all be fairly similar uh, because there's more protein in that Milo Stover, it's gonna take a lot less supplement uh, to meet those, uh, similar to the, the gin trash as well. So, you know, using these types of feeds along with a, a byproduct, uh, type supplement, you know, if we can get that laid in uh, with a, you know, cost similar to that, you know, uh, to these relationships as far as the soybean meal, you know, we should be able to win our cow from, you know, uh, 40 to cents to about $2 per day. Um, I threw in, uh, simplified this to further to just those that we would uh, either see an associative effect or not using the uh, distiller's grains in relation to our molasses tubs, uh, two, figuring a two pound intake on the high intake tubs and a 75 hundredths of it or a three quarter pound intake on the low intake tubs. Um, if we're fairly close to meeting our cow's requirements, um, such as with this prairie hay um, or the stover or the gin trash, these supplements can be used to meet the, the cow's nutrient requirements uh, or protein requirements. Um, we will lose body condition score at about the same rate as what we'd see with the distillers. Um, on that, if we have a very wide difference between the requirements and the um, the forage or the or the uh, the haze nutrient composition that very low intake uh, tub won't meet our protein requirements. So it's going to take additional supplement to to meet those cows' requirements. And here with the prairie hay, you're about ninety percent of the protein requirement. Uh, and with the straw, you're about 55% of the protein requirement. If it's slightly higher and, and that difference is fairly narrow, you know, that supplement will uh, come quite a bit closer to meeting the cow's requirements. So in conclusion, uh, protein feeds will be high this winter. I think everybody kind of expected that. Uh, most of the roughage sources that we're going to be looking at will be low in protein but they will also probably require some level of energy supplementation to, to meet those, even with our lowest requirement type animals, you know, even our dry pregnant cows. It appears like these byproduct feeds may be a, a economic value compared to other feeds. Even though they're a lot higher than we're normally used to paying, they're still cheaper. Uh, at least some of them are per unit protein basis and can be used to supply both the energy and, and protein we're gonna need. Um, Self-fed supplements will work with these moderate quality roughages um, and for our, our low uh, requirement cows. So if we're gonna rely on those types of supplements, uh, we probably should look at our, our hay quality uh, in relation to the cow's needs. 
uh, and see how close we're going to make it. So with that, uh, I appreciate the um, opportunity to speak and you know, we sure entertain any questions you might have. Dr. Beck, we did have a question in the Q&A. And just as a reminder for our participants that may be joining us for the first time today, you're certainly welcome to put your questions either in the chat or the Q&A, and uh, we will take them from there. Dr. Beck, are you seeing the question? Yeah, I can see the question. So okay. uh, Brian uh, Frecking asks, says, uh, alfalfa, if it's right at 60% uh, TDN and, and a crude protein of a uh, 19 or, or 20. Um, it's TDN to crude protein ratio. And I've, I've always been told uh, never to do math in your head uh, in front of people or in front of an audience, but I can do this. It's right at three. Um, so um, it's, you know, on the other side of, of unbalanced almost, um, where it has more protein available than the energy available to incorporate that uh, into uh, uh, microbial uh, crude protein. So it's, you know, going to work with the similar to the, the, the alfalfa protein, if we use it to uh, meet the protein requirements of the animal at the rumen level and we we keep it below uh, you know three or four pounds per head per day we should see some positive associative effects uh, especially with a lower quality uh, base diet the um, you know at a you know if if we have that low of forage quality uh, it's going to be, um, you know, it's fairly hard to um, only feed about three or four pounds per cow per day of, of an alfalfa hay. So, you know, if we split it up into every other day feeding, that gets to, to six pounds per day. Um, alfalfa protein is, rumen, for the most part, ruminally degradable. So we'd probably see a decrease in forage consumption on the day it gets fed and a, and a positive associated effect the next day. Uh, so essentially though, you can just figure a kind of a wash as far as the, the uh, change in, uh, probably no change in total uh, forage intake or the, the low quality forage intake um, is, would be my guess with that. Um, we had a question on where does tall fescue fall as a winter pasture and, and or hay. Um, the winter pasture of tall fescue and the hay we normally get from tall fescue are, are two very different products. Um, the fall pasture of tall fescue is going to be very similar to um, to what we see with wheat pasture. It's going to be over 20% crude protein. Uh, and, you know, the leaf of that, if, if we've uh, got fresh regrowth through the fall and early winter, it's going to be uh, 85 to 90% digestible. Um, the hay, um, when we produce hay from tall fescue, um, you know, that occurs um, usually in, in May or June. Um, April is whenever we start seeing stem elongation. And if we can harvest that product at some time before seed head emergence, it makes a very high quality hay. Um, usually that's when we're getting our rain. So um, it loses protein very fast um, after, after seed head emergence. Um, so for the most part, that hay is, is going to be about 10% uh, crude protein. 
uh, and in the mid 50s TDN. And, and if it's delayed even further into the uh, real late spring or, or into June, it can be much lower than that. Um, we, you can use tall fescue as a as a supplement um, or or as a total feed for for uh, beef cows. Um, if it's not very toxic, you can uh, even just limit graze uh, fertilized tall fescue uh, pasture along with hay and uh, use that to meet your protein requirements. The uh, next question we have, um, where can we get the tables from today's presentation? I do have calculator. So I um, populated some of the feedstuffs um, with some, some of the uh, average um, lab values that we've got for those different uh, roughage sources. Um, if you have calculator, then, then you should be able to, to balance some of those diets, uh, similar to how I was able to. Um, they, uh, Dave and, and Roslyn will post the link to access today's presentation. So you can see those tables that I used um, if you needed to, to use that as a basis for your own calculations and calculator for your own cow herd. Um, one other question. Um, I took note of your point on to consider consumption of specific forage residue sources and not just the feed analysis. Uh, this may be difficult to pinpoint directly, but should be considered. Thank you, uh, Kevin. It's, um, there's, there's definitely some rule of, rules of thumb for whether we can expect uh, positive associative effects um, versus uh, just no, no positive associative effects. And um, in my mind, that occurs right there at about seven to eight percent crude protein, um, or you know that ratio, much over eight, um, we can really expect to see positive associative effects in those diets. If we get much um, above that in crude protein or below that in that ratio, we're not going to see those uh, increases in intake that you would see uh, with those lower quality forages. Uh, I have a question here that uh, fescue tested 14% crude protein and 64.5 KDN uh, for winter stockpile. Uh, how cautious should we be since this is Kentucky 31? Um, depending on your location um, and the toxicity level, uh, on those fall stockpiles, there are different toxic compounds that do increase uh, during the winter. Um, one of our uh, research locations in Arkansas I, I dealt with that utilized a lot of uh, uh, toxic call fescue stockpiling, they uh, uh, at certain points had um, problems with um, fescue foot, um, ears freezing off, and, and some of that, based on restricted blood flow in, in, in a, you know, very cold situations. Um, other locations, as we get it, you know, further north into um, northeast Oklahoma, into southeast Kansas and Missouri, just the, the climate conditions are more conducive to keep tall fescue in a stand. And so the toxin levels uh, or the amount of endophyte-free free plants in those stands actually decreases as you get more into the better uh, climatic zones for uh, cool season uh, perennials. So um, depending on where you're at, it could be a concern, but uh, 
anybody in Maryland, I, I don't think that that would be too much of an issue as far as the uh, toxin load. Um, you can, uh, with a forage quality that's that good, you can limit graze it a certain amount um, and uh, uh, not give them full access to it to decrease the total uh, tall fescue intake. Um, but that would also be, you know, 14% crude protein and 64% TDN. You know, that would about meet the cow's requirement for a lactating cow. Uh, so, you know, if you have dry cows, that's going to be better than what, what they really need. Uh, so you could use that as a supplement to, you know, feed, uh, let them have access. Um, eight, six or eight hours a day, every two or three days a week until they start calving and then give them unrestricted access after that. Any, any other questions? I'm not Forget. seeing well, any, we've, Dr. Beck. Now we've had a, a lot, of, lot of good things to consider there and uh, that resource will be available to you here just you know, it seems like it takes us about two days to get those posted, but uh, they'll be posted there on the website, deep.okstate.edu, that Dr. Biggs uh, demonstrated at the beginning of our program here today. So thank you very much, Dr. Beck. Excellent uh, information. Look forward to seeing you all uh, next week. Thanks for the uh, great turnout here today. There we go. Right there, she's showing you the... Uh, link to the archive we archived webinars, which uh, will get you to all of those series links. And then within each of the series is each one of the, the daily sessions. So you kind of need to know which series uh, the session that you're interested in uh, was posted to. So, all right, Dr. Beck, Dr. Biggs, anything else? Not for me, thank you very much. Just a reminder, if we'll ask our attendees as you close out, if you would fill out our post-webinar um, post survey, that is incredibly helpful for us. And then uh, we will see, see you next week with JJ Jones. <laughs>